June the 17th, 1978, Anders Storp, Sweden, a Brabham race car, sits in the paddock with its rear end covered by a steel dustbin lid. When mechanics fire up the engine and remove the cover, rival teams watch in horror as the car visibly sucks itself into the ground. What they're witnessing is the most controversial piece of engineering Formula One has ever seen. A machine so dominant it would be gone within three days, erased not by regulators but by the quiet calculations of one man's ambition. This is the story of Gordon Murray's fan car, the Lotus Stranglehold. The 1977 season had been brutal for Brabham. The team limped home fifth in the Constructors' Championship, watching helplessly as their main rival Lotus finished second. But 1977 was just a preview of the nightmare to come. Lotus had unleashed something revolutionary, the Type 78, the first Formula One car to properly exploit ground effect technology. By carefully shaping the car's underside, Lotus designers discovered they could accelerate air passing beneath the chassis, reducing pressure and creating massive downforce. The genius of ground effect was its efficiency. It generated cornering grip without the drag penalty of conventional wings, meaning cars could corner faster without sacrificing straight line speed. When the 1978 season opened, Lotus unveiled their perfected weapon, the Type 79. At the Belgian Grand Prix in Zolder, Mario Andretti and Ronnie Peterson's black and gold machines outpaced the entire field by a comfortable margin. The Lotus 79 wasn't just fast. It was untouchable. Andretti would go on to win the championship in the Black Beauty, and every team in the paddock knew they were already obsolete. For Brabham, the situation was dire. Their problems ran deeper than aerodynamics. The Alfa Romeo Albatross, team boss Bernie Ecclestone, had made a calculated bet years earlier. Convinced that Ferrari's dominance came from their powerful flat-12 engine, he'd negotiated a deal with Alfa Romeo to supply Brabham with their 12-cylinder power plant derived from the Tipo 33 sports car. On paper, it seemed brilliant. In reality, the Alfa Romeo flat-12 was a disaster. The engine was heavy. It was unreliable. It consumed fuel at an alarming rate. For two years, Brabham hadn't won a single race. But the engine's worst quality wasn't its weight or thirst. It was its width. By early 1978, Brabham's chief designer, Gordon Murray, had figured out exactly how Lotus was achieving those remarkable grip levels. Murray understood ground effect. He grasped the principles of venturi tunnels and underbody aerodynamics. But understanding the solution and being able to implement it were two very different things. The Alfa Romeo flat 12 was simply too wide to permit the Venturi tunnels needed for significant ground effect. The wing-shaped side pods that made the Lotus 79 so devastating? Impossible, with Brabham's engine package. Murray's car was stuck with a slab-sided chassis, aerodynamically compromised from the start. Copying Lotus wasn't an option. Murray needed something else entirely. The Ghost of Jim Hall Gordon Murray had always been Brabham's out-of-the-box thinking designer. He'd previously created the BT-42 with its remarkable triangular monocoque and the BT-44, which had scored race wins in 1974 and 1975. Murray's reputation was built on finding unconventional solutions to impossible problems. And in 1978, he faced an impossible problem. Murray began studying alternatives to traditional ground effect. His research led him back to 1970 and a machine that had terrified the North American Can-Am sports car series, Jim Hall's Chaparral 2J. The 2J was nicknamed the sucker car for good reason. It featured two fans at the rear of the chassis, driven by a dedicated two-stroke engine that drew massive amounts of air from under the car. By forcibly extracting air from beneath the chassis, the 2J created downforce through pure mechanical means, no complex aerodynamic shapes required. The car had proved significantly faster than its opposition before suffering reliability problems with its second engine and ultimately being banned by sporting authorities. Whether the Chaparral directly inspired Murray remains unclear, but both cars would use the same fundamental technology, a large fan that physically sucked the car into the ground. 
There was just one problem. Formula One regulations prohibited movable aerodynamic devices. A fan generating downforce would clearly violate that rule, unless the fan was primarily for something else. The Heat Exchanger Gambit Murray's initial BT-46 concept had been radically ambitious. Instead of conventional radiators, the car featured flat panel heat exchangers mounted flush to the bodywork. The idea was elegant. Eliminate radiator drag, gain the equivalent of an extra 100 horsepower, and produce a lightweight design with low frontal area. Engineer David Cox calculated that the BT-46 had only about 30% of the cooling surface area required. He contacted Brabham expressing his concerns. By then, the car had already run, suffering serious overheating problems. Cox concluded the concept couldn't be made to work. The heat exchangers were abandoned, replaced by more standard, nose-mounted radiators similar to the BT-45. But the failed heat exchanger experiment had taught Murray something crucial. He needed to reposition the radiators. And if he was going to move the cooling system anyway, why not mount it above the engine, where a fan could serve double duty? The fan would be driven directly from the engine's crankshaft, not a separate motor like the Chaparral. Its primary function, at least on paper, would be engine cooling. The downforce generation would merely be a beneficial side effect. More than 50% of the fan's power would be dedicated to cooling, ensuring the car stuck to the letter of the law, if not its spirit. Development happened at incredible speed. The project took just weeks. Unique Physics The BT-46B's fan system created handling characteristics unlike anything in Formula One. Traditional ground-effect cars like the Lotus 79 were dependent on road speed. The faster they went, the more air rushed through their venturi tunnels, the more downforce they generated. But the Brabham's downforce was linked to engine speed, not road speed. At 12,000 RPM in first gear, the fan generated the same suction as 12,000 RPM in sixth gear. This gave the Brabham a massive advantage in medium-speed corners where the Lotus relied on velocity for grip. The Brabham simply didn't care about speed. It generated grip through engine revolutions. The effect was dramatic. Even when stationary, the BT-46B noticeably sucked itself into the road as the engine revved. The car literally pulled itself down onto the tarmac. To help drivers manage this bizarre characteristic, Murray installed an altimeter and pitot tube hooked to a gauge in the cabin. Green meant good downforce. Red meant insufficient, add more throttle. While the engine provided three-quarters to seven-eighths of total downforce, conventional front and rear wings provided the rest for balance. Driver Nicky Lauda found the car distinctly unpleasant to drive. In his autobiography, he described it as relying on aerodynamics over driver skill, exposing him to extreme lateral loads. But he also realized every driver would soon be dealing with such G-loading as ground effect development accelerated. The whole project was shrouded in immense secrecy. The cars were designed and tested with minimal exposure. Lauda and teammate John Watson had only a couple of outings at Brands Hatch for preliminary testing before the Swedish Grand Prix. When not in use, the massive fan was covered by a steel dustbin lid. Bernie Ecclestone understood immediately that the BT-46B's performance would trigger a political firestorm. Other teams would protest, demand investigations, threaten withdrawals. The fan car's only hope of racing was to appear less dominant than it actually was. Ecclestone issued strict orders, send the drivers out with fuel tanks filled to the brim and mounted on the hardest compound tires available. Watson and Lauda were given explicit instructions to underdrive, to deliberately not show the car's true pace. The strategy was to hide in plain sight. June the 17th, 1978 the reveal. When Brabham arrived at Anderstorp for the Swedish Grand Prix, they brought only the fan cars. The team argued it would be impossible to convert them back to standard BT-46 specification before the race. Behind the scenes, a deal had already been struck. Ecclestone had negotiated with the other constructors before the race even began. The agreement? Let the Brabham's race in fan configuration at Sweden let the results stand regardless of outcome, and afterward the cars would never appear again with the fan fitted. It was a devil's bargain. 
one race in exchange for permanent withdrawal. When mechanics removed the dustbin lids covering the fans during practice, pandemonium erupted in the paddock. The moment drivers blipped the throttle, the cars could be seen squatting down on their suspension as downforce increased. Deep unease washed across rival team garages. This wasn't just innovative engineering. It was a fundamental reimagining of how a race car could work. Lotus driver Mario Andretti was vocal in his complaints. It is like a bloody great vacuum cleaner. It throws muck and rubbish at you at a hell of a rate. Murray disputed this angrily, arguing the physics made it impossible. The fan efflux velocity was only 55 miles per hour, and the radial design would send any debris sideways, not backward. The accusation, Murray believed, was fiction designed to get the car banned on safety grounds. John Watson, Brabham's other driver, would later describe the complaints from Andretti and Lotus team boss Colin Chapman more colorfully. They lied through their back teeth. The real reason for Lotus's fury was simple. Gordon Murray had reversed the Lotus 79's technical advantage in mere weeks. Andretti had won the previous two Grands Prix in Belgium and Spain. The championship was in sight. And now, this Brabham monster threatened to rob them of everything, including the 1978 Constructors' Championship. Race day, a demonstration. Despite Ecclestone's sandbagging orders, Watson and Lauda still qualified second and third behind Andretti's Lotus 79. But qualifying with full tanks and hard tires was one thing. The race would reveal what the fan car could actually do. Lauda moved into second place by lap two. The race was unfolding as a classic battle between Brabham and Lotus. Until lap 20, Watson's throttle began sticking. He fought the problem for several laps before spinning out and retiring. Now only one fan car remained. Then came the moment that would define the BT-46B's legend. Jean-Pierre Jabouille's Renault dropped oil onto the circuit. Cars ahead of Lauda slipped and slithered, fighting for grip on the treacherous surface. Conventional ground-effect cars lost downforce as their Venturi tunnel struggled with the contaminated track. Nicky Lauda simply nailed the throttle. The fan spun faster, generating more suction, and the Brabham stuck to the circuit like it was glued there. Lauda motored through the oil patch while everyone else scattered like marbles. When Andretti made a driving error, Lauda seized the opportunity and passed him. Andretti tried to fight back, but his Lotus developed an engine problem and retired. The race was over. Lauda won with a commanding lead of over 30 seconds. The margin of victory was so enormous, it shocked even the Brabham team. Such was the performance of the machine Murray had created. It was Alfa Romeo's first win since their return to Formula One. It was also the first and last time the BT-46B would ever race in world championship competition. Rival teams immediately demanded a stewardess meeting. Protests were filed. The fan car was declared to violate the spirit of the regulations. Technical arguments raged, but the stewards concluded the car was legal. The fan's primary function was engine cooling. Over 50% of its power served that purpose. The downforce generation was a side effect. The letter of the law had been followed. Lotus immediately began design work on a fan version of the 79. McLaren and Tyrrell prepared to follow Brabham's concept. A technical arms race was about to explode across Formula One, and that's when Bernie Ecclestone killed his own creation. The political calculation. Ecclestone had become president of the Formula One Constructors Association during 1978. He had ambitions far beyond winning races. He wanted to run the sport itself. That required the support of the other team bosses. Colin Chapman, backed by the other FOCA team principals, issued an ultimatum. Withdraw the BT-46B or lose their support for Ecclestone's leadership. Chapman threatened to rally the teams against Ecclestone's growing power within Formula One's political structure. The message was clear. If Ecclestone wanted to build his empire, the fan car had to die. Ecclestone attempted to negotiate a three-race reprieve. The discussions failed. Three days after Lauda's victory, Gordon Murray watched his masterpiece get dismantled.
the cars were returned to standard BT-46 configuration with immediate effect. The fan car project was terminated. The bitter irony is that the BT-46B was never actually banned. The FIA later declared that fan cars would not be allowed going forward. But the Swedish Grand Prix result stood as legal. The car was voluntarily withdrawn by Bernie Ecclestone, a sacrifice on the altar of his political ambitions. Murray had already designed the BT-47 for 1979, a car with twin variable geometry fans and a Chaparral 2J-type rear end to maximize ground effect. But the FIA closed the loophole in the regulations before the BT-47 could be built. The fan car concept was dead. In 1979, the BT-46B made one final appearance at Donington Park for the Gunnar Nielsen Memorial Trophy, a non-championship event run in time trial format. Without FIA sanction, the car's illegality didn't matter. Nelson Piquet drove it to a fourth-place finish among five competitors. It was a quiet epilogue for a machine that had terrorized Formula One. Why it had to die. Looking back decades later, even those involved admitted the withdrawal was probably justified. John Watson acknowledged the danger. There was a considerable danger of entering a field of design and technology that no one really understood. The precedent of high-mounted wings in the late 1960s haunted Formula One's memory. Those early aerodynamic experiments, supported by fragile struts, had been banned after a series of serious crashes. The fan car threatened to trigger another frightening period of rapid, uncontrolled development. Formula One hadn't yet entered the carbon fiber era. Chassis tubs were becoming very skinny. The potential for raising cornering speeds to two and a half or even five Gs was a real possibility, and an alarming one given the fragile construction of contemporary cars. Watson could foresee another period of serious accidents and severe mechanical failures because the technical capability to support the concept simply didn't exist yet. If fan cars had been allowed to proliferate, every team would have built one. Technology and chassis design wouldn't have kept pace with the aerodynamic potential. Everything would have escalated out of control. Common sense, Watson concluded, had ruled the day. The Brabham BT-46B raced once, won once, and vanished. Not because it was illegal, but because it was too good. Gordon Murray had exploited a loophole to build a machine that rewrote physics, only to watch Bernie Ecclestone sacrifice it for political power. In the end, ambition defeated the fan car more thoroughly than any regulation could have. We'll never know how dominant the BT-46B might have become. That question died in a Swedish paddock three days after the greatest victory it would ever see. But the ghost of the fan car haunts Formula One to this day. It represents everything the sport both celebrates and fears. Radical innovation that threatens to destabilize the competitive order. When engineers push boundaries, when designers find loopholes, when someone builds something so effective it makes everyone else obsolete, the system protects itself, not through rules, but through politics. Murray went on to design championship-winning cars for Brabham, and later created the legendary McLaren F1 road car. Ecclestone built his Formula One empire, eventually becoming the sport's supremo for decades. Lauda added one more world championship to his collection. But none of them ever forgot that June afternoon in Sweden when they'd held the future in their hands and chosen to let it go. The BT-46B proved that genius isn't always rewarded. Sometimes it's just too inconvenient. And somewhere in a museum, covered in dust, sits a Brabham with a hole in its tail. A reminder that in Formula One, the most dangerous thing you can build isn't just a fast car. It's a car that makes everyone else look slow.